Hey YouTubers, this is Lonnie Clark, Nuts for Art. I'm going to finish, I'm not going to finish, I'm going to continue reading the oral history of Dr. John Goffman. Uh, and these are the oral histories of the human radiation studies remembering the early years, conducted December 20th, 1994, United States Department of Energy Office of Human Radiation Experiments, 19, June 1995. So as you recall, this is Dr. Goffman giving his interview. At that time, Glenn Sheline had joined our group. We wanted someone to work on the microchemistry on the grounds that we might soon have a little bit of plutonium to work with. If you work with little, if you work in little capillaries, things like that, you can do chemistry at the very small level. Within a couple of days after Oppenheimer had taken his milligram with him, which was a 20-fold increase in the world supply, by the way, Glenn got the remaining two tenths. He precipitated it. We went through the... I wonder what that means. That must mean something. He precipitated it. We went through the basis of the whole process, and we could see sodium plutonal... plutonal acetate, plutonyl, P-L-U-T-O-N-Y-L, sodium plutonyl acetate. So we got to see plutonium for the first time. The whole process we had gone through, we had never seen it, the plutonium. We were just tracing it by its radioactivity. During that whole period, everything moved towards scaling up for Hanford. I used to go back to Chicago every four to six weeks while we were transferring information to the DuPont engineers who were going to operate Hanford, trying to get them to understand what we had learned of the chemistry. By then, I had quite a bit of radiation exposure and didn't know too much about it. We were very careless, by the way, in the way we handled things. None of us knew a damn thing about it. Glenn Seaborg, who poo-pooed the whole thing, he still does. He's obviously wrong as hell. Gourley. But back then, pretty much nobody knew. Goffman. There was a lot known that I didn't know. I hadn't gone back and looked over everything of that era from the day of Rotingen discovered the day Rotingen discovered the X-ray in 1942. That was a whole era of medicine and radiology I hadn't looked at. I looked at it hard this last year. Gourley. Okay. Goffman. I talked to Latimer of University of Ber California at Berkeley, UCB, and said, What would you think? I don't want to go to Hanford. I had had a lot of radiation with the work on the radium and a lot of radiation for the plutonium isolation. That was a dirty job, converting the whole ton of uranium down to plutonium. I said, I think I might like to go back to medical school. The war was still on, 1944, and he said, if you stay in the project, I'm sure we can arrange an academic appointment for you under the Department of Chemistry. However, I was interested in the medical school, and I said, I'd like to apply for admission to the second year class. I told them I had the first year at Western Reserve, and they admitted me to the second year class. I finished up my medical work at UC San Francisco. Oh, UC, University of California, San Francisco. By then, I had a lot of capital built up in Berkeley as a result of having been one of the workers in the early days of the RAD, RAD lab. I didn't know John Lawrence. How didn't we know about John Lawrence? I didn't know John Lawrence and I knew, knew Ernest only a little but I did have capital earned. I applied for an academic position. I visited the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota and talked about a position there. 
Joe Kennedy and all of the chemists from Los Alamos had gone to Washington University in St. Louis. Hmm. I called Joe up to ask how they were doing. He said, why don't you think of coming here to Un Washington University? Arthur Compton had left Chicago to become a chancellor at Washington University. I visited there and they offered me a very nice position in radiology, which I thought of doing. But finally the Berkeley Assistant Professorship came through in the Lawrence, John Lawrence's division. John was Ernest's brother and had come to Berkeley to work. When Ernest said maybe there's something in artificial radioactivity that might be of interest to medicine. He had come in, he, he had come out in 1937 or 38 and worked. They created a division for him, essentially in the physics department, which was called the Division of Medical Physics. It was John Lawrence, Joe Hamilton, Hardin Jones, and Cornelius Tobias. They had worked together dur some during the war. Joe Hamilton had worked on various radioactivities and meta metabolism of fission products, including plutonium. I joined the department and became an assistant professor. I didn't have anything to do with radiation except I worked one day a week at John Lawrence's clinic treating people with radioactive phosphorus, in quotations, leukemia, polycythemia, 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 unquote, sorry about that guys, P-O-L-Y-C-Y-T-H-E-M-I-A, polycythemia, I think that's how you say it. By the way, I had an additional appointment within the medical school as a lecturer, but then I got to do less and less at the medical school because aside from the one day a week at John's clinic and the teaching of handling radioactivity in the lab, I had started to work on heart disease. I had some ideas on how you would study, you might study cholesterol. Hefner. So you have many questions in this area. I don't want to take you off course. Oh, it, they said we have many questions in this area. I don't want to take you off course. Goffman. Please do, just tell me. Hefner, I want to talk to you about your colleagues, certainly Joe Hamilton, Dr. Tobias, and Dr. Jones. There seems to have been quite a lot of contention between the Department of Medical Physics at UCB and UCSF. Goffman, yes. Hefner, why don't I just leave it at those two topics and then we'll go into the heart disease. I've got a few questions about that too. Goffman. I did start working on heart disease. We were able to figure out why the previous work ended with bizarre results that happened in the cent ultra centrifuge, an instrument for studying proteins and lipoproteins. We solved that in 1948 and published our findings and open the way for our discovery of the whole consequence of low density lipoproteins. We worked on coronary disease. I got the Stufer Prize in 1972 for the work on heart disease. Last year, I was honored by being a guest speaker at the American Heart Association. It had been a long time since I worked on that, but I gave a talk it took me about six weeks to prepare it. Okay. At any rate, about Berkeley, my joint appointment with the medical school was in the Department of Medicine, not the radiological department. But I knew, not in great detail, there was bad blood between the Department of Radiology and John Lawrence. Joe Hamilton was working in Crocker Lab. At that time, it was the building where the 60-inch cyclotron was. And Joe was working in collaboration with the people in the Department of Radiolo Radiology. I think something happened very early that made Dr. Stone and the others in radiology very jealous of John Lawrence. 
to the extent, yeah, like they they won't get uh, they don't they don't get prosecuted. How about that? You can kill anybody you want. These people are fucking insane. To the extent that I understood it all, it just seemed as though they felt since they were radiologists of the Bay Area University of California, it should all be in their department. Here was this guy, John Lawrence, off by himself and independent of them. And they didn't really like that, but John, John, Joe Hamilton and John Lawrence were never close to each other. I had known Joe Hamilton in, in the following way. When I was a student of Glenn Seaborg, I was a graduate student, Joe Hamilton had scheduled bombardments of the 60-inch cyclotron. So when you needed to get something done, like I needed a bombardment, like 25 pounds of thorium nitrate to do the DU, the 233U work, you went to Joe Hamilton and got it scheduled. Now I did some other work on uranium-232, still another nuclide, and Joe had to arrange those bombardments. So I got to know him only through his being the chief honcho at the Crocker Cyclotron. Joe was a very, very careless guy, and if anybody was going to be hurt by radiation, it was going to be this guy, because he just didn't seem to care. Okay, so I'm going to stop there. The next title is Joe Hamilton's Cavalier Approach to Radiation, but I know we've read enough, and it's pretty late. And we're going to be interviewing uh, Thomas Goffman in the morning. If you missed the live show, please get the podcast. That's the Age of Fission radio show, www.ucy.tv forward slash AOF. And just Google my name, Lonnie Clark. Put your courage feet on, you guys. Uh, thanks for listening. Let's get through this.